Welcome everyone. Today we continue our RSET training, NASA Atmospheric Composition Ground Networks, supporting air quality and climate applications with part three, introduction to the Pandora instrument and the Pandonia Global Network. Before we get started, we'll introduce you to the presenters you'll be hearing from today. My name is Melanie Follett Cook, and I am a research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and project scientist for the RSET program. I'm very pleased to be joined today by three other presenters. First, Dr. Thomas Hanisco, the principal investigator of the Pandonia Global Network from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And Dr. Hanisco will be followed by Dr. Horva Pandey, an assistant research engineer from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and by Dr. Brian Place, an atmospheric scientist from SciGlobe. By the end of part three today, we hope that participants will be able to identify the basic characteristics of the Pandora instruments used by NASA for ground-based passive remote sensing of trace gases, recognize how the Pandonia Global Network sustains global long-term observations, supports air quality in climate applications, and complements satellite observations. We also hope that you'll be able to access relevant Pandora and Pandonia Global Network data for a given location and application purpose. To recap, in the first two parts of this training, we learned about AeroNet a passive remote sensing network providing information about aerosols in the atmosphere. Alongside aerosols, trace gases are another key atmosphere component we can measure with remote sensing. These gases, including nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and formaldehyde, are present in small amounts but have large impacts on human health and climate. To detect these gases using remote sensing, we need hyperspectral instruments, that is, instruments with a high spectral resolution, which help us identify the unique spectral fingerprints these gases leave on light passing through the atmosphere. Some examples of hyperspectral instruments on satellites, which you might be familiar with, are OMI, which stands for the Ozone Monitoring Instrument. OMI is on the Aura satellite and has been operating since 2004. TROPOMI, or the Tropospheric Monitoring Instrument, is a newer instrument on the European Sentinel-5 precursor satellite and launched in 2017. There's also the newly launched TEMPO instrument. TEMPO stands for Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. TEMPO is a geostationary hyperspectral instrument helping us understand hourly changes in atmospheric trace gases over North America. In today's training, we'll learn about a ground-based hyperspectral remote sensor, the Pandora instrument. If you have any questions during today's training, you can put them in the questions box within WebEx at any time. At the end of the training, we'll try to address as many of these questions as we can, and we'll post these questions and written answers to the training page within about a week after the training. And now I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Thomas Anisco. Take it away, Tom. All right, thank you, Melanie. Today I'll be speaking about the Pandora instrument and the Pandonia Global Network. The Pandora instrument is a ground-based instrument that you makes measurements using light from the sun. The reason we make these measurements from the ground is that NASA has all these satellites in space trying to make measurements, and it's extremely challenging. And one of the biggest challenges that these satellite instruments have is making measurements using the sun as the light source. They don't know what the optical path is from the sun down to the ground and back up to the instrument. For example, here I show the distribution of formaldehyde in the atmosphere. And you can see that formaldehyde is not uniform. It, it's totally structured and it can show up at the ground or it can show up at eight kilometers. In the atmosphere, you get all sort of scattering uh, species such as molecules, clouds, and aerosols so that the light doesn't always just come down to the ground and then reflect. 
The light can come from the sun and reflect off of an aerosol at say four and a half kilometers and then go up to the satellite. Or it can hit a cloud at six kilometers and go to the satellite. It's very difficult for satellites to understand exactly what that light path is. Where on the other hand, the Pandora instrument sits at the ground. As you know from your own experience, if you look up in the sky, the sun is the brightest object in the sky. There's absolutely no ambiguity for the Pandora instrument of what that light path is. The light path is from the sun down to the Pandora instrument. So the ground-based remote sensing instrument, the Pandora, has an extremely easy job of telling what that light path is. And what our goal is, is to use these ground-based sensors that have an easy job to help inform the satellite instruments that have a complicated job on how well their retrievals are doing. The Pandonia Global Network is our network of the Pandora instruments. It's a joint effort from the European Space Agency and NASA, and also two private companies, SciGlobe in the US and Luftblick in Austria. We also have other partners, such as the US Environmental Protection Agency and the South Korean National Institute of Environmental Research. Together, we all operate this global network of Pandora instruments. This is a picture of the Pandora instrument, and it's not necessarily a typical installation, but it has all the features of the instrument. The head sensor is mounted on a dual axis tracker, and you can see that up here. The dual axis tracker moves the head sensor to track the sun during the day. It can also move off of the sun to make measurements of the sky. Inside this head sensor are several optics, and they are moved around with these uh, mechanized wheels, we call them filter wheels, but those optics rotate in and out of the light path to change the kind of light that's, that gets transmitted through the head sensor. The head sensor collects the light and then it transmits it through a fiber optic cable shown here in yellow. And this fiber optic cable is about 15 meters, so it's really long. And it sends it into this black box called the electronics enclosure. Inside this box, we have a spectrometer, a control computer, and some electronics. The instrument is designed so that this head sensor and, for example, this tripod can be mounted outside while the electronics enclosure can be mounted inside. This is an example of a spectrum that's measured by the spectrometer, and you can see here the signal. And this is the signal from, from the sun. You can see in this, this top small photograph with the uh, crosshairs, that's the image of the sun that we're measuring with the instrument. All these little lines here are lines, they're called Fraunhofer lines, and they, they're part of the sun's light. And we resolve those with the spectrometer. The spectrometer has about 2000 pixels in the x-axis, and that's our wavelength access. By resolving the different wavelengths of the light, we're able to determine the fingerprint of the instrument. In the y-axis, that's the intensity, and we measure that in counts. The intensity of the light depends on the light source. So of course, we have more light when we stare at the sun than at the sky. But both these numbers, the, the x-axis, the wavelength, and the y-axis, the intensity, are used to retrieve gas, the gas phase species. The spectrometer itself works with a grating. This is the output of that uh, fiber optic that I showed you a couple of slides ago. So this 15 meter fiber optic goes into the spectrometer and goes through a slit, hits a first mirror, then it hits the grating. The grating disperses the light. And in this case, we're looking at light from 280 nanometers to 560 nanometers. So that's the UV shown by the purple all the way to the red, shown by red. But the spectrometer resolves the wavelengths to about a half a nanometer. So it's a very fine resolution in, in this spectrometer. Pandora makes two kinds of measurements. The primary measurement is using the sun or the moon as the light source. And most of the time, of course, we're using the sun as the light source. 
In this case, we have a field of view that is slightly larger than the sun so that we can always have the sun in our field of view. And it makes it easier for our tracker to keep the sun in, inside that viewing angle. In this measurement, we use Beer's law to determine the concentration of species between the sun and the instrument. Most of the distance from the sun to the instrument is deep space, so we're actually only concerned with the first uh, maybe 30 or 40 kilometers of the Earth's surface in this absorption. But the Beer's law ex uh, experiment or measurement is relatively simple in this arrangement. The other measurement mode that we have is called Max Doaz, and that's where we use the sky as the light source. And as you can imagine, it's much, much more complicated than using the sun. And that's because we don't have a single point source for the light. The sky gets illuminated by all sorts of scattering. Scattering from the surface of the earth, right? So the sun hits the earth and then the reflections go up or the sky hits the molecules and they scatter. Likewise, aerosols and clouds. Regardless, we're able to measure the light from the sky and we we set the pandora to multiple angles so that we can derive the the angular distribution of that absorption and from that we can derive profiles of the gas phase species we've had a network for approximately five years now this is the growth of the network over those last five years we started with just a few instruments and now we have about 180 instruments. In the beginning, most of the instruments were NASA instruments, but we've had large investments, as I mentioned before, from the US EPA, uh, ESA, the European Space Agency. COECA is the Korean Space Agency, and a large number of instruments were purchased for COECA through the United Nations UNESCO project. Right now, NASA only owns a little less than a third of the instruments in our global network, and the majority are owned by other institutions. But NASA and ESA operate these instruments because of our interest in validating the NASA and ESA satellites. I should mention South Korea got heavily involved in the network because of their own satellite, GEMS, that was launched a few years ago. This is the distribution of the network. You can see we have about 170 instruments. The uh, unofficial instruments will eventually become official. It's just our bookkeeping. And on average, we've added about 37 instruments a year. Next year, we'll probably add about 30 instruments. So the instrument is still growing rapidly. Well, that's the overall picture of the Pandora and the PGN network. Next, Brian Place will be talking about the PGN structure and calibration. Thanks, Tom. Um, so as uh, Tom was saying, I'll uh, discuss some of the PGN's network structure and also give a brief overview of both the laboratory calibration and field calibration that goes into the data analysis. So this is the PGN, an overview of the PGN network structure here. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of components, um, a lot of personnel that also go into maintaining the PGN network. And I'll start from the left in this uh, network structure map and then work my way around clockwise. So the first component in uh, the PGN network is uh, remote data pushing. Um, the uh, PGN network relies on um, all of the raw data from our instruments around the world to be pushed to a PGN server where um, the operators and also the scientists can work with the data to help diagnose issues and also process the raw data to the final data outputs. Um, also along with the remote data pushing, is um, remote monitoring software where the operators and scientists can also log in to each instrument and, and check on the operation status of all of the instruments in the network. Now, coming back to the network map, 
Um, I'll quickly go through some of the operator um, and scientist roles before I get to the lab and field calibrations. Um, so I'll start off with the local operators. The roles of the local operator are to mainly be on the ground, um, hopefully performing regular inspections of each of their instruments. Um, ideally, that would be weekly, but depending on um, access issues and how easy it is to inspect an instrument, um, some of the inspections um, can take longer to, to do for, uh, by each local operator. Um, and their goal is also to communicate any um, communicate with any of the network operators to help diagnose these issues um, and, and really work with the whole PGN team to get an instrument back to operational status as soon as possible. Um, and also to be in constant communication uh, about instrument repairs and upgrades. Now with network operators, their goal is to perform weekly diagnostic checks of each instrument remotely. Um, and this involves logging into each instrument and also um, looking at the PGN processed uh, raw data um, to closely look into the diagnostics to determine if there are any issues um, as soon as possible with an instrument. And um, they're the main communicators with uh, the local operators to resolve these issues. Um, and they're also in charge of coordinating the repairs and shipments of instruments. And then finally, there's the administrators and scientists, and um, their main goal are to, is to perform the laboratory and field calibrations and also analyze the data. Um, and part of this involves um, regularly um, uh, quality assuring the data. Um, this doesn't get checked or as often as the diagnostic checks um, that the network operators do. Um, but it is a key uh, part of the network that um, all of the data quality is assured on a, and, on a regular interval. Um, and then also it's the job of the administrators and scientists to um, continue to do research and development into the hardware and software um, products and uh, pieces of the Pandora instruments. Um, and with that, I'll now come to the calibration portion of the um, uh, PGN network. And um, that begins with the lab calibration, which occurs in the NASA Goddard Space and Flight um, facilities. Um, and the goal of the lab calibration, or the, the overarching goal, is really to take these um, rod level zero files that get pushed from all of the instruments around the world and convert them to our level one data, which are the lab corrected process data. Um, and then also we want to try and determine and um, uh, note down the additional instrument characteristics needed to process uh, the final level two data um, using these level zero files. Um, and as of uh, early, in 2023, we've also been using the lab calibration analysis to process out of the box um, Pandora data products, which are ones that can be processed directly from our lab characterization. And these include ozone to total columns and our sky max DOAS um, data products, um, such as uh, the NO2 and formaldehyde tropospheric columns and profiles. Um, and um, other data products um, need the full field calibration um, before uh, they are included in the uh, data outputs. So this is just a uh, kind of schematic of what the goal of the lab calibration is. So on our left here, we have a raw uh, level zero spectra from an instrument. Um, which shows uh, pixels on the x-axis, and we get our raw counts on the y-axis. And the goal of the lab calibration is to use or to generate a calibration file where we can now start describing um, the spectra in wavelength space and then also in irradiance with a sensitivity correction. 
Um, and there are a lot of steps that go into this level zero to level one um, uh, char uh, characterization. Um, for those who may be familiar with um, uh, CCD detector calibration or um, working with um, characterizing optical systems, um, these are just some of the terms um, and characterization steps that um, go into our calibration file. So there's things such as pixel non-uniformity, sensitivity, signal to noise, um, wavelength disturb dis uh, dispersion, and um, a lot of other characterization steps that go into the final calibration file. And we do these, uh, we or we back out these different characteristics using a combination of atomic lamp light sources and a 1000 watt halogen lamp. Um, and then coming back again to the network structure, I'm going to uh, quickly discuss the field calibration step now um, that goes and takes our level one data and converts it to our final um, level two fit and level two data. Um, so in this field calibration, the uh, main goal is to generate an absorption-free synthetic reference spectrum. Um, ideally, around using uh, Pandora measurements for each site around local noon on a clear day, um, and the and the goal of this step is to um, subtract out um, the concentrations of our absorbing gases and produce a clean reference spectrum that can be used uh, uh, moving forward um, in our retrievals to um, uh, pr produce the total columns of NO2, formaldehyde, and SO2 um, on all future days. Um, the other goal of field calibration is to um, closely look into each period and reference spectrum and verify the quality and usability of each trace gas product. Um, and if needed, uh, the field calibration um, may, need, may be applied two or three times per instrument um, depending on uh, on data quality and drift. Um, so again, just a visual um, schematic to show this step. So we had our level one data um, generated from the lab calibration where we are now in wavelength and irradiance space. Um, and to generate our level two and level two fit data, we then apply either a measured or literature reference um, uh, from to our data to do the correction, or we apply our uh, newly created absorption free synthetic reference to generate our um, columns. And we do that using the Beer's law um, fitting, where we just look at the ratio of intensities and then we look at the characteristic absorption of all of our absorbing gases to back out the slant column. And just to um, go into a little more detail of the, the characteristic absorptions, i have um, showing here a plot of all of the um, uh, uh, atmospheric gases of interest and where they tend to absorb in their wavelength space. And you can see here, it's very complicated. And there's a lot of mess of different gases. Um, you'll see some of our key ones are much stronger absorbers like ozone, formaldehyde, um, NO2, and SO2, um, which we do fit each um, gas as the primary gas in the retrieval window. Um, but we do actually also in our um, fitting have to um, take into account some of the weaker absorbers that are in the same fitting window. So I just wanted to quickly show um, a figure here of all of the different um, gases that need to be considered um, uh, when fitting uh, to go from the level one to level two data. Um, and now with that, um, I will hand off the presentation to my colleague Apoorva, who will discuss some of the data outputs um, from the PGN and also 
um, give a quick overview of some of the quality flagging and quality control that we do um, at the PGN. Right. Uh, so thank you, Brian. Brian walked us through the steps it takes uh, to go from raw data collected by Pandora Instruments to fitted slant columns. Um, but the final version of data that end users deal with are, are L2 files, which take slant columns and convert them into a more useful data product. Um, so all our L2 files um, have codes attached to them. These are retrieval codes or R codes. Uh, starting with an R for retrieval. And then uh, these codes designate the gas, trace gas in question, um, what wavelength region was used for fitting it, and the type of reference that was used in this fitting. So what R codes do is take um, slant columns fitted in the instrument viewing geometry and then convert it into either a vertical column or partial vertical columns, depending on the observation mode. In direct sun mode, uh, answering the question, how much of the atmosphere did the light pass through is, is easy because you're tracking the sun, knowing the instrument location and where the sun is relative to the instrument, it is purely a problem of geometry to convert from slant to vertical columns. In multi-axis modes, it is a little bit more complicated to uh, define the light path, but we use supplemental measurements uh, in addition to the trace gas fitted slant columns to convert these uh, into partial vertical columns or tropospheric vertical columns and near surface concentrations. From the Max DOAS observation geometry, we produce near surface concentrations for formaldehyde and NO2. As Brian mentioned, this is an out of the box data product. These concentrations are derived from measurements made near the horizon. Uh, we prefer to make these uh, measurements at one degree elevation from the ground if the view is unobstructed. Sometimes in a particular location, the view may not be unobstructed, so we move to a higher angle. And then this observation is extrapolated down to the horizon. Um, a caveat when dealing with ground-based remote sensing concentrations is that these are not true concentrations at any point in space. They are horizontally and vertically smudged. Uh, the figures I'm showing here have near surface NO2 concentrations taken from their native units and converted into parts per billion. Uh, and on the left, the plot is for an urban site in Washington, DC. And the right plot shows Londonary New Hampshire, which is a rural site, and if you look at the scales on the plots, there is a lot less NO2 in the rural site. From the Max DOAS uh, observations, we also have lower tropospheric columns, uh, lower because there is a vertical limit to how far up the instrument can see in this observation mode. It's typically about three kilometers altitude from the surface. Uh, these columns are calculated from measurements made at two different zenith angles and um, converted into a column amount. So the plot here shows formaldehyde tropospheric columns uh, observed at Washington, DC, and, and then uh, at Greenbelt, uh, Maryland, at our NASA Goddard uh, uh, Pandora site. Um, and these two sites are 13 miles away and they measure very similar formaldehyde because formaldehyde is a trace gas species that is um, spatially relatively homogeneous. So in the zoomed in plot for the single day, you can see that at these two sites, the measurements follow each other closely, even on that small time scale. In the following section, I will talk about uh, the Pandora data files and how the profile data are provided in those files. Um, and it's typically a top height followed by the concentration in that layer, and then it builds up from the first layer on. Um, on the right hand side, the figure shows uh, partial NO2 column profiles for our site at Washington, D.C., and I'm showing data from two different months. And then finally, from the direct sun observation mode, we have total vertical columns. 
So this is fitted for all our trace gases, uh, NO2, formaldehyde, SO2, and ozone. Um, as Brian described, this retrieval needs a synthetic reference spectrum, so it requires a field calibration um, because we observe the sun directly in this mode. We have high signal to noise, but this measurement is subject to changes in the instrument over time, so field calibrations are a routine requirement. The figure on the bottom shows formaldehyde total columns uh, at the Washington DC site. I've overlaid them with the lower tropospheric columns from max to as observation mode. And there's more to the column than what the max to as observation mode sees. So the total columns are a little bit higher than the lower tropospheric. Now I will talk about PGN data files, where you can find them, what information is contained, where you can see all these different data products in the files. All PGN data is publicly available at pandoniaglobalnetwork.org. Um, if you go to the downloads link on that website, you can get data, you can get reports and publications and manuals that describe a lot of the uh, process of getting end user data from raw measurements. The website contains a readme document that is a reference for all our level two data. Uh, there are tables like the one shown here on this slide, which describe the output products, the observation mode, all this information that we've given an overview of, and more details are available in this readme. The data archive contains uh, product files for these trace gases and observation modes. So as discussed, formaldehyde and NO2 have direct sun and sky scan data, and the other trace gases have direct sun data only. Uh, you can download data by navigating to the location that you're interested in, select the right Pandora ID for, the, for a given instrument, and then go into the L2 data folder. All the files are named with the Pandora ID, the location, and the retrieval code, the retrieval code breakdown that I showed a little bit earlier. Um, and you can see it here. Uh, Pandora 140, Washington DC, L2, and then FUH5, that is formaldehyde in the sky scan mode, or FUS5, which is formaldehyde in the direct sun mode. Every data file has a uh, header that contains the name of the instrument location, the local PI, um, the exact instrument location with latitude and long longitude. When did they start collecting data at the location? Are there any caveats associated with the data quality? All that is in the header. Further down in the data files, we have column headers that describe uh, what the file contains. Uh, a, a lot of the early headers in the files are date and time, uh, the observation geometry. These are usually, uh, this is usually information that's useful for advanced data users. And then there's the description of the actual data columns. So for a sky scan data file, that might be the surface concentration, uh, it's an uncertainty, the vertical column uh, in the troposphere, and it's uncertainty and profile information. For direct sun data files, the header only contain the total vertical column and the associated uncertainty. The other column I've highlighted here is the data quality flag. The data quality flags have information about each measurement in a data file and whether we consider that measurement trustworthy or not. The first digit place of the quality flag comes from a manual quality assurance process. This involves someone in the PGN QA team taking a look at the data products and then marking it as quality assured or unusable, which indicates a fundamental instrument problem. If an instrument has not yet gone through the process, it would be marked as not assured. The second digit of the data quality flag 
is an automatically generated number that comes from slant column fittings. This is based on the residuals once the spectra are fit. And there is a certain threshold above which the data would be marked as medium or low quality. If the residuals are low enough, that means we expect less error in the calculated columns, then the data is considered high quality. Low quality does not necessarily mean that there is something wrong with the measurements. Um, sometimes atmospheric conditions change fast enough that it appears as a residual in the fitting. It just means that it, these data require more careful investigation from the end user. I'd like to end with a brief discussion of some of the data applications for PGN data products. Here I'm showing a figure from a recent paper uh, by Adams et al. published in JGR Atmospheres. Uh, this is showing data from Pandora's deployed in Boston, which is a um, urban coastal site. And they use the combination of near surface concentrations and column measurements to look at how NO2 is distributed within the atmosphere, which helps them determine something called the mixing layer height. And then the authors divided the mixing layer height estimations, uh, the categorized the mixing layer height uh, calculations based on the prevailing wind conditions. So this helps us learn about air quality at a coastal urban site. The second example ties into what Tom talked about in the beginning of this training, uh, a critical value of ground-based remote sensing instruments is in validating satellites. In this paper by Judd et al, um, they compared Pandora NO2 columns with the Geo Tasso instrument, which is a precursor to the instrument deployed aboard the Tempo satellite. And Pandora measurements were used to validate Geo Tasso measurements in this case. And now I'd hand it back to Melanie for presenting a summary of this training. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey, and another thank you to all of our presenters today. Now, at the end of part three, we can add Pandora and the Pandonia Global Network to our list of ground-based remote sensing networks for atmospheric composition. To recap, Pandora is a passive hyperspectral instrument capable of collecting information on trace gases in the atmosphere, especially ozone, formaldehyde, and nitrogen dioxide although retrievals of other trace gases like sulfur dioxide are possible. There are 168 official state stations in the Pandonia Global Network, supplemented with a few unofficial stations. In the direct sun or moon observing mode, Pandora collects information on the total column concentrations of trace gases. While in the max DOAS or sky scanning mode, Pandora can measure lower tropospheric profiles or near surface concentrations. It's important to note that only formaldehyde and nitrogen dioxide partial columns and profiles are currently available from this mode, not ozone. It's also important to note that the near surface concentrations are not the same as in situ measurements from ground based air quality monitors but are more smudged measurements taken as the instrument points out near the horizon. Nevertheless, there are many applications for the PGN data, including studying the complex interactions of trace gases in the lower layers of the atmosphere and validating current and future hyperspectral remote sensing instruments, such as the newly launched TEMPO mission. Looking ahead in part four, we will learn about another instrument network looking at trace gases in the lower atmosphere, the Tropospheric Ozone LiDAR Network, or TOLNET. Unlike Aeronet and Pandora, TOLNET uses active remote sensing to measure the atmosphere, which we'll learn more about in the next part. Quick review and reminder, this training series will have one homework assignment. You can access the homework assignment from the training webpage starting at the end of the training on August 22nd, and answers should be submitted via Google Forms by September 5th. 
certificates of completion will be issued to participants who attend all five live trainings and submit the homework before that deadline. Certificates will be issued by email about two months after the training. This slide shows the contact information for myself, as well as today's speakers, as well as links to the RCEP website, our YouTube channel, and Twitter or X, and our sister programs, Develop and Servere. And finally, here are some links to more resources for the Aeronet and Pandonia networks. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll now transition over to the Q&A portion of the training. In this section, we'll walk through each of the questions as we received them. And we will start with question one. Is GEMS, which was mentioned during the training today, also a hyperspectral instrument? Um, Yes, the Geostationary Environment Monitoring Spectrometer, GEMS, um, is part of a new constellation of geostationary hyperspectral instruments. Um, while GEMS covers Korea and East Asia, um, there are several Pandora instruments that have been deployed to support evaluation of GEMS. Um, the constellation also includes TEMPO, which will be over, which is over North America, recently launched, um, and will eventually include the Sentinel-4 sensor over Europe and North Africa. Question two, are there any examples where the solar energy industry has used Pandora instrument data? Uh, this participant gets asked this question often, so I'll ask the Pandora team. Let me know if you guys have trouble unmuting. Yeah, can you repeat the question, please? Sure, sure. Um, so question two is, are there any examples where the solar energy industry has used Pandora instrument data? This particular participant gets asked this question often. Yes, and the answer is we have not been in any communication with the solar power industry. It's a good question because we could provide real-time hyperspectral solar flux so that they could better optimize panel design and location. Great. Um, and I think that participant put their um, information in the chat. Um, oh, question three, um, how do I join the Pandora network? Well, the network is a network of instruments, not people. So instruments join the network. Uh, instruments can be purchased from SciGlobe and then you're given an option of joining the network. I must say that some people buy instruments and never join the network because they have their own research goals. But once you buy an instrument, NASA and ESA, ESA will calibrate the instrument and coordinate the membership application. And I have put some links to SciGlobe and the PGN site here. Excellent. Question four. Given that the Pandora spectrometer is ground-based, what is the approximate area it samples in terms of distance from the instrument's location? Um, they're asking to understand the difference in coverage compared to satellite instruments. The Pandora instrument in direct sun mode is always following the sun, and so the area measured in, the, in that configuration is very small, very local to the instrument. In the max DOAS mode, uh, the instrument may be looking out towards the horizon or at a specific angle. And in that case, how much of the distance it sees depends on how clean the environment is. When there are lots of aerosols present, uh, just like any other camera uh, instrument, the visibility is lower. When it's clean, it can look out further. So this distance varies and we retrieve an estimate of what the horizontal viewing distance is. It's some, it can be four kilometers, it can be eight kilometers. That's typically the range. Thank you. Question five, what factors go into the placement of PGN sites? There seem to be a high density of sites in the Eastern US. Is there a reason for that? 
So there's this is a, a big question that I'll, I'll first just answer the EPA. Uh, the EPA was interested in using the Pandora for air quality studies. And so the EPA purchased several instruments, I think over 25, and installed the majority of them at EPA sites along the heavily populated I-95 corridor along the east coast of the U.S. So that's why you see such a high density there. Uh, likewise, you'll see a high density in Korea because the Koreans were interested in the instrument for their GEM satellite. Uh, you see a high density in Japan and also in much of Asia. Whoever buys the instrument gets to locate the instrument. So uh, people who buy the instrument have their own interest. Uh, the Norwegian group, for example, is interested in polar regions. So they have an instrument up at New Islesen, and they also have one in Antarctica. Uh, so yeah, the placement is determined by the interest of the owner. That makes sense. Um, question six um, is kind of confusingly worded. It says rather than FTIR. Yeah, so I took this to mean why the the UV viz, why not FTIR? Mm -hmm. And uh, FTIR or UV uh, Fourier transform can also measure these same trace gases. And I've, I've listed in this, this answer several uh, locations where we're co-located with an FT spectrometer. So we have the JPL spectrometer near PAN 68, uh, a TCON site near PAN 74, uh, Michelle Gruder's uh, FT spectrometer in Mexico City, and uh, PAN 204 next to the NCAR spectrometer. FT spectrometers tend to be much larger and more expensive, and they tend not to have the fiber coupling that the Pandora has, so they're a lot harder to um, uh, put out in the field. So the Pandora is a small mobile instrument, and the FT spectrometers tend to have fixed location. Uh, and there's, there's a lot fewer of the FT spectrometers because of the cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, question seven. How do I check quality control on the AOD data from the Aeronet level two? So this is touching on our parts one and two. Um, and we see here level two Aeronet have already gone through some quality control and parts one and two of the training, um, I think particularly part one, address this in more detail. Um, and recordings of these are on the training website. Question eight. Are there any projects to assess coherence between Aeronet and Pandora? Uh, they use different instruments and methods, but the retrievals would not differ so much, right? Um, does one of our panelists want to address this answer? So I took that to mean uh, that they were asking whether both instruments can retrieve the same, same data and can we compare those? Um, so there are efforts to retrieve aerosols with Pandora. These are research efforts. And when they do happen, those comparisons will be made. But the main challenge uh, is that um, Aeronet instruments, their radiometric performance is gets an absolute calibration, which means given what the instruments measure in terms of counts, you can accurately calculate what the irradiance is at that location. Pandora instruments only get a relative calibration which makes aerosol retrievals hard. Gotcha. And question nine, um, what is the next level of Aeronet derived data following the current ones, such as AOD, single scattering albedo, et cetera, in advancing aerosol characterization and air pollution assessment? So I think this is kind of asking about higher derived products um, and I think I'm not sure we have Dr. Gupta on today. We can potentially follow up with him um, about this question and or look back to uh, parts one and two and see if that's addressed there. Um, so we'll we'll fill in this answer 
before we post the Q&A to the training page within about uh, a week from today. Question 10, what about the aerosol optical depth from the direct component of solar radiation? The procedure for SIMO could be applied for the retrieval. Again, this, this seems to be an Aeronet uh, focused question. So again, we can follow up with Dr. Gupta. Um, question 11, what does it mean when you have a level two product from Pandora, but it says data are unvalidated? The data are unvalidated uh, statement is a qualitative uh, and subjective statement of data quality, uh, meaning that the network thinks that certain products are not mature, as mature as some other data products have not gone thorough intercomparisons with other measurement sources. Uh, this does not imply uh, any malfunction with the instrument or it does not imply that data are not quality controlled. Okay, question 12. What is the typical timeline from level zero to level two retrievals, for example, for NO2 for an individual Pandora instrument? Uh, yes. So for this question, um, it typically takes about three to six months um, to get all of the L2 uh, products up on the website. Um, and this largely depends on the, the field calibration timeline and the field calibration um, usually requires one to two months of good clear weather data. And it also requires one of the PGN scientists um, to go in and analyze and produce the synthetic reference spectrum. So the timeline, the current timeline is that usually when an instrument is installed on location, it will have all of the data within the first six months. Um, but it will start producing some of the L2 products, such as the Max DOAS products, like the NO2 profiles will be available um, within just one to two weeks after the install. You know, I should add the latency between data acquisition and posting on the site is if we have good internet connection, it's about 15 minutes or so. Okay. Question 13, are there any examples of K through 12 engagement using Pandora? Um, the instrument we operate is on the roof of a high school. Ideally, this would benefit the high school students through formal curriculum use, science club use, or co-location of other sensors near Pandora. But building such a program from scratch is difficult. Any templates or examples would be appreciated. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of Pandoras at high schools. Uh, there's the University of Iowa has PAN 246 installed at West High School in Iowa City, Iowa, and NASA has PAN 254 installed at the Gray Hills Academy of the Navajo Nation in Tuba City, Arizona. Currently, we do not have any programs for K through 12 engagement using the Pandora, but NASA is actively working to develop curricula for uh, universities and junior colleges through the uh, increasing participation in minority serving institutions. That's IPMSI program. So our hope there is that the universities themselves and the colleges themselves will develop the curriculum. And once that curriculum is developed, they'd be able to share that with high schools, but it's hard for them to develop it specifically for the high schools. Mm -hmm. Question 14, what is the cost of a Pandora instrument? I would like to compare the Pandora ozone parameter with a Dobson instrument um, for the total ozone column. Can you suggest yeah. some papers to study the process? Yeah, so the, the cost, so we do not sell the instrument. 
the instruments are sold by a company called Cyglobe. So the, the cost, as I understand it, is around $50,000 for a 1S spectrometer and around 70K for the 2S spectrometer. But you need to follow up with the manufacturer, Cyglobe, and we provide the link to Cyglobe. Uh, there are a number of papers, especially out of the, uh, the Canadian, uh, in, it's called Environment what is it? In Environment Canada. Canada. Environment Canada. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a, a several papers that we can uh, will will post where you can see the comparisons between the Pandora and the Dobson. So these studies have already been done, and uh, the agreement is is usually very good. But we still we have an evolving product for the ozone retrieval. Our next version will be more accurate than it is now. And when is that next version um, expected, do you think? I don't know. It was supposed to be done this summer. Okay. I'm hoping it'll be done next summer. Sounds good. And yes, and we'll continue to link relevant papers there. Um, question 15, is it possible to link the AeroNet derived parameters to the Pandora data to obtain more fascinating analysis, especially in air pollutant, uh, air pollutant assessments, and can this be done? Yes, absolutely. And this, I think it was question eight that Apoorva was answering earlier about the calibration of the SOML for the Aeronet network and the Pandora for the PGN. Uh, even though the Pandora doesn't have that absolute calibration, it does provide the spectral information. And we have several co-located Pandora and SIML instruments. They can measure the same thing where you can use the SIML to calibrate the Pandora instrument in the field, or at least use it as a reference. And then the Pandora could give you the hyperspectral aerosol optical depth. Uh, this is an active area of research and it's not ready for operational use. But there's a number of scientists looking at this exact question. How do you get, how do you derive hyperspectral aerosol optical depth using a Pandora instrument? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, question 16. Why do some species have both multi-axis and direct sun retrievals while some, for example, ozone, only have direct sun? Yeah, the main reason for this is the uh, the multi-axis is a tropospheric measurement. So it, it's it's looking at the scatter in the lowermost part of the atmosphere, and it works really well for species like formaldehyde and NO2, where there's a large tropospheric abundance. In the case of ozone, uh, the vast majority, like 95, 96, 98 percent is up in the stratosphere. And so when the, when the multi-axis method is used on ozone, uh, it's seeing a very, very small differential in the atmospheric absorption between the different uh, sun, uh, the different instrument angles. So it's, it's mostly a problem of signal to noise, right? All of the ozone is in the stratosphere, so it's really hard to measure the tropospheric component. Okay, question 17. What are the wavelengths or wavelength ranges at which Pandora instruments measure? Um, most Pandora instruments have a UV visible spectrometer and they measure in the range of 290 to 540 nanometers. Um, two S instruments have two spectrometers, including uh, an additional visible measurement in the 430 to 960 nanometer wavelength range. Thank you. Question 18, could you explain what out of the box data products means? So this is related to um, what Brian talked about in the presentation about field calibrations. Some data products don't need a field calibration. We can retrieve them using just the lab calibration. 
Um, so these become operational as soon as a new instrument is installed and it's formally added to the PGN network. These data products start getting uh, produced and uh, posted on the PGN data site. Um, others like direct sun NO2, formaldehyde, and SO2, they need field calibration uh, to be performed. So these are not out of the box. And this, I think, leads directly into the next question, which is asking, could you please expand on how the field calibration is performed, um, potentially briefly describing the steps, which I think was covered, but if you want to add anything um, onto what was covered during the training. Sure, I, I, I can add a little bit to what I said. Um, so just to... Um, go over it again. The goal of the field calibration is really to produce a trace gas absorption free reference instrument uh, as a reference spectrum from uh, the specific instrument. And the, the real advantage of this is that we can use the instrument specific reference spectrum over an external reference spectrum um, that can better offset some of the um, instrumental characteristics such as stray light that may not have been fully characterized during the laboratory analysis. And the, the way that the spectrum is produced is we select a, a clear sunny day um, around noontime, and we average about a, a few minutes to produce a, a reference spectrum. And then we need to acquire about a month's worth of um, L0 data um, around the reference day and we, um, I won't go into detail, but we use a Langley extrapolation. If anyone is interested, can look that up. And we use this to determine and subtract the absorbances from the trace gases to produce our reference spectrum. Okay, thank you. Uh, question 20, what is the temporal and spatial resolution of the instrument? Can it detect emission sources far from the location of the instrument? The, the spatial resolution question, uh, we addressed that in question four and how that's different for the different measurement modes. Um, and uh, to get to the second part, uh, no, we can't detect emission sources far from the location of the instrument. Um, um, because in max DOAS mode, as I said, the spatial reach of the instrument is of the order of a few kilometers up to eight or nine kilometers. Mm -hmm. um, so depends on what the question asked or mean by far. Um, for, as for the temporal resolution, the in, again, it depends on the measurement mode. Direct sun measurements, they take under a minute. Um, the max DOAS uh, profile scanning all those different angles, it takes about 10 minutes. And um, any uh, instrument is lo uh, comes with a predefined measurement schedule. Uh, it alternates between these measurement modes to maximize data availability in for both types of measurements. Um, but instrument PIs have some flexibility uh, to choose the kind of modes that they're most interested in. So uh, resolution cannot be defined the same way as a satellite instrument. And again, this goes back to the PIs having pot potentially specific science questions for their particular instrument. Mm -hmm. um, question 21. Um, I wanted to use the data from 2000 for all atmospheric parameters. Where can I get that? And Looks like uh, the PGN network was not operational in 2000. Um, can you remind us when observations really began in the network? It started around uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. The instrument's been around for uh, since 2012 ish or so, but it was really just one, two instruments here, there, five, five or 10, and they were never operational, meaning they, they weren't set in permanent locations and continuously producing data. They were used for field campaigns and for individual studies, but the, the formal operations began in 2019. Mm -hmm. All right, question 22. Is the field calibration data, clear sky at noon, 
uh, from one day or multiple days? And is that repeated over time to monitor for drift? We have a new instrument installed this month in the Arctic that we monitor remotely. Should we be do documenting cloud conditions at the noon hour as monitored by a webcam? Yeah, so I think I answered most of the first question there um, mm -hmm. when answering question 20. Um, but just to follow up on then the second question, um, we it is repeated over time and we do monitor each instrument for drift. Um, some uh, instruments uh, tend to drift more than others and may require a new field calibration every year. But we do have quite a few instruments in the network that um, where one field calibration has been able to be sustained for three or four year periods. Um, and then to answer the final question, um, it's not necessary to document the cloud conditions. Um, we're able to actually use the instrument measurements to figure out um, when the best clear sky days are, and we also can look at past weather. But it is very useful, in particularly in locations where there's a lot of cloud cover and there are only a few sunny days each year to know which days are the best days, and that, that definitely is helpful to know. Um, and if that's locally documented on the PC, that definitely saves us some time with the field calibrations. Okay, question 23. Um, where can I find the data for a specific location? So this, I think, will depend on the locations of the Pandora instruments themselves, and um, that information can be found on the website. And is there anything our panelists would like to add on to that? Uh, so all the data that exists for all the locations, including ones that are not operational currently, but had data in the past, everything is on uh, that website. Excellent. Question 24. For total column measurements, besides satellite comparisons, what other instruments can be used to compare with Pandora? Yeah, so that was answered a bit with the uh, Fourier transform question. Mm -hmm. uh, Fourier transform spectrometers would be the uh, the primary for the, the range of trace gases. And then there was the question about the, uh, the Dobson spectrometers that are used for ozone. So the Dobson's, you could compare the ozone product with the Pandora. Uh, also, you know, Pandora is not the only Max Doaz or Direct Sun UV Viz spectrometer. There's a, a number of instruments in, um, well, globally, they're not part of a large network like this, but individual instruments can be compared. And it looks like maybe in the future we'll be able to compare AOD with Aeronet. Potentially, yes. Um, question 25. Uh, I would like to know how many Pandonia instruments are located in Africa. So I think this information can be found on the website linked above. Um, but I'll open it up in case anybody happens to know off the top of their head. <laughs> yeah, there's only a few. Uh, there's a couple in South Africa, and I, I, I noticed that Raffle Way uh, is on the meeting. She's the PI of one of the instruments there, uh, and we also have one in Dakar. Uh, but we hope to add uh, two or three instruments in the next year or two, and that would be through the Satellite Needs Working Group, SNWG. Okay. Question 26, why not distribute all instruments globally instead of having dozens of instruments in already well-monitored regions? Um, autonomous instruments, could, oh, sorry, instruments could be made autonomous by adding solar panels and satellite comms, um, would be paid well by the value of having more interesting data. And I think this was addressed a bit uh, during the training or it, during the Q&A earlier. Um, in that many locations have been chosen um, in association with current satellite missions, um, such as GEMS and TEMPO, um, but I'll open up it in case any anybody wants to add any additional thoughts. Yeah, and uh, for example, 
for NASA's own goals, we have the Tempo satellite. And if you look at the map, we, we have very few instruments in the middle of the US. But it's very challenging to find a location to host the instrument. It needs infrastructure, right? It needs power, it needs internet, and it can't have trees in the way. So it's surprisingly difficult to find locations wherever you want. Mountain locations are especially difficult because we can't get a clear view of the sky in mountainous regions. So a lot of times it's not just the money, it's you know to buy an instrument, it's the location is not suitable for an instrument. Okay, question 27. For Pandora retrievals, is it possible to download the total optical depth at certain wavelengths? Um, so is AOD a product that's currently available? No, but you but you can download what we call the the L1 data. So that's the the calibrated uh, spectral radiance. Uh, it's not in absolute terms, but the spectral calibration at least is accurate. So that could be compared with the Aeronet and scaled. That that was. Also addressed in an earlier uh, question. Mm -hmm. Okay, question 28. How do I transfer the counts against pixels into concentration of specified trace gases? So I think this question, uh, unless I'm mistaken, is potentially so the level two data for the column, for example. Um, well, I'll, I'll let the panelists weigh in, but I think. Um, the question is really asking how to uh, convert the level two data into concentrations that you would compare with the ground-based in situ monitor. That's what I'm guessing. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. So the L two data is it will either give the column abundance or the uh, abundance at, at different altitudes. Uh, we do offer a product, it's called the, the surface concentration, and it's not truly the surface concentration, it's, it's the extrapolation down to the ground concentration. And that can be compared with in situ measurements on the ground. Okay, question 29. How do you cope with low quality data? Um, if need, if you need to include uh, more uncertain measurements because you don't have an alternative, is there a way to know the uncertainty with which you are dealing or a way to confirm whether or not you can rely on that data? So there's, there's, this is a good question and there, there's two answers to this. Uh, first of all, uh, the PGN, since it's this operational and it's this automated network, it provides data quality flags that are largely determined from signal to noise of the retrievals. So the quality uh, would be degraded, for example, if there's clouds in the sky and there's low light levels, and we could determine that with the signal to noise. Uh, this kind of statistical treatment can only do so well at determining data quality. A second level that we do is by scientists looking at the data and comparing the data to what you might expect the data to look like. And any irregularities in the data might indicate a problem with the data. Uh, we call this this QAQC is very time consuming, and there's no um, prescribed structure to how the how it goes about. Uh, but sometimes instruments start producing bad data. At that point, we would tell the PI to send the instrument back to NASA, and we would either fix the problem or recalibrate the instrument. Okay. 
Okay, looking at question 30, we've addressed this question directly above. The exact pricing uh, can be found through SciGlobe. Um, question 31. Can Pandora tell the altitude of a tropospheric column it detects during one scan? Is this the same altitude of the highest layer in the max DOAS scan? Uh, yes, it is the same altitude as the highest layer. Yeah, and I'd add to that, though, the, the profiles that Pandora produces are, for example, if you look at formaldehyde, uh, the, the top layer will be roughly corresponding to the top of the uh, boundary layer. But there's a fair amount of uncertainty at that level because the, the measurements are less sensitive the higher you go up. So there's there's error bars associated with that estimation, and that needs to be taken into account. So the uncertainty goes up with altitude. Yes, roughly. Okay. Yeah, it, it it's it's complicated enough that you you can't just simply take the profile and assume that's the top of the boundary layer. There's there's a lot more going into it. So we're we're not willing at this point to say you can do that during one scan. Mm -hmm. Can Pandora data be downloaded for any city or only cities where Pandora instruments are located? And and data will only be available where the Pandora instruments are located. They're ground based uh, single instruments. Yes, that's correct. Um, question 33. When Pandora uses the moon as a source of light, does it use the reflectance from the Rolo model? So um, the lunar retrievals are still currently under development. But the uh, initial approach did not use the Rolo mo model, but instead use um, higher order closure polynomials to account for the uh, lunar albedo. But um, the Rolo model may be explored as the retrievals are continuously developed. Okay, question 34. How can we compare Pandora NO2 tropospheric columns to model simulations? With satellites, there are usually averaging kernels that can be used, but I'm not sure about Pandora. Would it be recommended to calculate the column up to a certain height? Um, so, as Tom said, there's some uncertainty in the height determination of the Pandora tropospheric columns. But recognizing that uncertainty, yes, uh, I would recommend um, integrating the column up to the Pandora tropospheric column height um, and maybe exploring sensitivity to how the Pandora tropospheric column height changes over time, um, building that into the comparison um, would make sense. But no additional averaging kernel needs to be applied to Pandora uh, troposphere column measurements to compare with a model, correct? Mm, at, at this time, no, we don't have an averaging kernel that we can provide. Yeah, so the, the Pandora retrieval doesn't have an a priori the way a satellite uh, retrieval would. And the tropospheric columns are, are generally uh, pretty good. If you wanted to look at the vertical profiles and the distribution within that column, then I would recommend that you average your model to the Pandora vertical distrib distribution. Don't try to interpolate the Pandora to the model resolution. Make, make sure that your Pandora data it remains the same as it's reported. Okay, looks like we're in our last uh, about five to seven minutes. Uh, question 35, how many lower tropospheric levels 
and at what heights, but I think this will vary, are available in the Pandora data sets. Uh, the number of layers, it's, um, uh, it can be 11 or 13, typically. If it's less than that, I would say that the profile is questionable. It might mean that one of the layers and count, uh, measurements for one of the layers encountered clouds and had to get thrown out. And that just puts all the other layers into question. So it should have at least 11 if you want to use it as a profile. Um, the heights vary and the heights are calculated, uh, estimated um, with some error bars and they're in the retrievals. Um, it's, it's not a uniform height grid. The angle grid that at, at which it takes the measurements is uniform, but what that translates to in terms of heights, that changes. Question 36, what is the spectral resolution of the hyperspectral instruments used to calibrate the Pandora instruments? So uh, we use, we don't use hyperspectral instruments to calibrate. We use light sources and the spectral resolution or the line width of the light sources varies. Uh, the line width of, of the lasers is below a picometer meaning that that's below a thousandth of a nanometer. So it's extremely narrow. Uh, we also use atomic light sources where the line width might vary, but they're typically below a nanometer and often uh, below a tenth of a nanometer. And question 37, I believe we addressed further up, how are the surface concentrations in the Pandora data products derived? We we addressed that at an earlier question. Um, for Pandora, um, questions about spatial frameworks. Uh, slides showing lat lawn uh, to four digits of precision and an elevation, but what is the grade of the location data? Why only four decimals of precision? And what is the spatial framework reference for these networks? So I think the question is essentially asking about like the accuracy of the geolocation for each of the instruments. We and, yeah. use Go ahead. Google Maps to get the location coordinates once we have a location. Um, and I don't getting any finer grain than that is not within the scope of what we do. Mm -hmm. When we do, we do have a, a instruments mounted pretty high on buildings. For example, at the City College of New York, it's it's pretty high off the ground. So we do care about the altitude. But uh, yeah, the location is, is is we just need to know it so we know where the sun is. Okay, question thirty nine. Uh, do you know offhand how many Pandora stations are co-located with Aeronet? I don't know the exact number. It's it's around 10 to 15, but we are currently cataloging that, and we hope to have a joint effort between Aeronet and Pandora to highlight those instruments. And maybe we can find this out quickly and update this answer. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I think we covered question 40. How is the retrieval different in the case of using the moon as a source of light? Um, also, does it do sky measurements at night? If yes, how do you take care of the low signal to noise ratio? I'm not sure the second part was covered in the previous question. Is there anything to add here? Uh, no, we don't do sky measurements at night. There just isn't enough light. Like to be able to do that. Okay, question 41, are there PGN sites in India? And uh, yes, there are two. Um, and again, the exact locations can be referenced from the website, which we included earlier in the chat, uh, earlier in the, in the document. And I, I actually don't know if uh, that's in the uh, PGN officially yet or not, 
Mm. Um, but yeah, we have two in India. And if they're not there yet, they will be soon. Um, we addressed question 42 during the training today about how Pandora network data can be accessed. Um, maybe uh, go, skipping to question 44, what is the detection limit of Pandora formaldehyde retrievals? You know, it, it depends on the instrument. We get a lot of variability in the quality of spectrometers. Uh, it can depend on the age of the instrument, but typically, uh, I mean, we can see formaldehyde in the middle of winter when the ambient abundance is below a part per billion at, at the ground level. Uh, I would worry more about the uh, accuracy and artifacts in the measurement. So there, for ground level equivalent, I'd say we can't do any better than, uh, say, half a part per billion. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe we'll take one or two more questions. Um, I think maybe question 46. Uh, NO2 measurements are utilized for mixed layer height estimation. Are there other factors considered along with it, like local or meteorological effects or measurements of other gases? So I think this is referring to one of the examples of the PGN data applications. I would uh, refer uh, back to the paper for detailed methods. Um, in this case, in this paper, they only used NO2 measurements and not other trace gases. But yes, they did categorize the data into different meteorological regimes and uh, examine what difference these regimes make to the mixing layer heights. And maybe we'll do. Um, so I see Tom is uh, answering question 47. Uh, how do researchers take advantage of the portability of Pandora instruments? Um, does it make sense to move an instrument around a city, or do you want do you often want more than one simultaneous measurements from nearby sites? Yeah, so we it, it's it's hard for us to get all the measurements if we're not in a fixed location, and that goes to that field calibration that Brian mentioned. But some of the simpler products, like the out-of-the-box products, especially NO2, we can do it from a moving platform. Uh, ships are especially interesting, and we've had several campaigns where we mount instruments on a ship. In fact, uh, we just finished one called SCO8, and we're starting a new one next month called PAX. And that's PAX is meant to validate the new NASA PACE instrument. Great. And I think we'll leave it there for today. We got through a lot of questions today. Um, I want to thank again to our presenters and our speakers. Um, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation and a really informative Q&A. Um, and thanks to our participants for joining us today. Please join us uh, next Tuesday, where we will go over um, the Tollnet Network with uh, Dr. John Sullivan. Thanks, everyone.